It's great to see you this morning. This morning we're in the book of Hebrews and we're going to start in chapter 11, verse 32. And uh, before I read that, uh, one of the things you might not know is what a master navigator uh, my wife Susan has been. Uh, she is really good if she has access to any map at all. She can get you from point A to point B. And before GPS was such a common thing, she would do that. We, would, uh, we were on vacation with another family out west, and so we had separate vehicles. And I remember them calling back to our car and saying, we need a rest stop. And Sue responding by saying, there will be one eight miles up the road on the right. It's a pink building. How she knew that, I have no idea. But, but uh, she just, we trusted her to navigate us from where we were to where we wanted to be. There was one time, though, that I, I took that responsibility away from her. She was in labor. <laughs> and we were driving from Jamestown, New York, to Buffalo, New York, where our children were born. There's a whole story behind that. But needless to say, it's a 90-mile drive one way. And she was going to start helping me drive better. Which, don't get me wrong, there's certainly room for improvement. But I figured she needed to pay attention to the labor part, and I needed to pay attention to the driving part. In that case, she had to trust me. Today, we're on a journey. And part of the navigation is going to be directed by what you hear me say. And so I am asking for a little bit of trust, uh, that I've done my homework, that as best as I can, I'm speaking truth. But that's not all that will happen here today. I believe God will start to whisper things to our hearts, to call things to our attention. I'm going to ask you to trust that too. So we're in Hebrews chapter 11, beginning in verse 32, and it says, What more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, the prophets, who through faith, listen just to the things that happened here, they conquered kingdoms, they administered justice, they gained what was promised, they shut the mouths of lions, they quenched the fury of the flames, they escaped the edge of the sword, their weakness was turned to strength, and they became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead raised to life again. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, and they lived in caves and holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised, since God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Today, um, all over the world, people are gathering to celebrate the most astonishing event in human history. That's not an overstatement. Um, it is so significant that it actually divides time. Everything that happened before that event is referred to BC, before Christ. Everything that happens after that event event is referred to A.D. It, 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 some people think it means after death. It's actually not what it means. It's a Latin phrase. It's Anno Domini, and it means the year of our Lord. Something happened 500 years before Christ. Christ is still the marked line, the timeline by which it's judged. There were, everything that's happened afterwards, it's the timeline by which things are judged. There's been lots of religious and lots of political leaders in the course of human history. No one has divided time like that. Uh, what's interesting is that when you look at the life of Christ himself, he had no wealth, he lived in poverty, he led no armies, he had no pedigree, uh, his life on earth was relatively short, he only lived to 33 years old, he died the death of a criminal, and no one actually knows what he looked like, though there are some people who've painted some paintings trying to guess at that. And yet, as, as all of those things are true, it is also true that desperate people and grateful people and worshiping people and people who swear 
I'll use his name every day. How does this happen? Jesus never married, and yet the way he treated and talked to women caused them to be attracted to this community of faith in numbers no one had ever seen before. He never wrote a book, but his teaching is preserved. And before Christ, this is really interesting, before Christ in human history, humility was considered a weakness and to be scorned. You always bragged. You never played the humble card. That was considered weakness. And yet now it's considered a virtue. And if you go back in human literature and scale back to the point at which that changed, it actually is at the cross of Christ. Before the cross, humility was considered a bad thing. And since the cross, it's considered a virtue. Every year, around the time of, of remembering the death of this man, there are people who will post blog posts and write articles and, and do TV exposés trying to suggest that there's reason to doubt his existence, his teaching, his miracles, all of that. What's interesting is that none of them can cast doubt on the influence this person has had in our world. There's not a close second. He's influenced our world more than any other human being ever. And the scripture that we're looking at today actually takes a surprising look at what it is and what happens when we exercise faith, when we, when we try to lean into faith in our lives and trust God for things. And the first thing that I want you to see is that it tells us that faith will change your life. Faith changes your life. And the way it starts out, it's really interesting and exciting. These are people who embraced faith, and look what happened. They conquered kingdoms. They shut the mouths of lions. This is a story uh, referred to in the Old Testament of a man named Daniel who was thrown into a den of hungry lions, and he came out unscathed. And it says, and, and they quenched the fury of the fire. He had three friends, actually, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were thrown into a fiery furnace, and they came out uninjured. They escaped the edge of the sword. They became powerful in battle. Their women received their dead, raised to life again. There's, there's two widows in the Old Testament whose sons died. And in the ancient world, if you didn't have a husband and you didn't have a son, you were done. There was no right to own property. You had no rights in society in the ancient world. And twice, uh, a miracle occurred so that a son was brought back to life so his mother could be cared for. Doesn't that sound great? If you have faith, it seems like you always come out on top. Uh, you win, you escape, you recover. And I will tell you that that does happen. I've, I've heard stories of people who place their faith in God and, and, and the diagnosis that they have been given and the prognosis that they have been given, uh, they wind up working their way through and recovering to health. Or, or people who was, were struggling with unbelievable financial setbacks and, and they found their way forward. And all kinds of things in life. But there's a passage, as it's reading through and giving all these things, it tells us this phrase, and we're startled by it. It says, and there were others. And then when we read what happens to them, it doesn't sound so good. So faith will change your life, but faith will not always change your circumstance. This is where the Bible is more honest than any person you will ever meet. The Bible does not hide things that are hard to explain or uncomfortable to hear. Some people don't believe the Bible because they struggle with things that are written in it. And uh, I, guess, I guess the only book we would feel completely comfortable with is the one we would write ourselves. But I'm not sure that's, that's the best book. So this Bible doesn't hide. It says there were others. It says they were tortured, beaten, imprisoned, killed, destitute, persecuted. They wandered and they lived in places that none of us would tolerate. So the question is, what happened to them? Did they not have enough faith? Because that's what people think. If, if your life isn't going well, if you just had more faith, you should know Jesus never said that. Jesus indicated that even the smallest amount of faith could make a difference in your life, but he didn't promise it would always change your circumstance. We are told in this passage that these people were also commended for their faith. Scripture reviews, re reveals that they escaped what could have been, looked like a resurrection for them, because everybody in the first category escaped death in some way. But everybody in the second category experienced death, 
in a very profound and punishing way. And it says, but they were looking for a better resurrection. All the people in the first category, they love to tell the tale, but here's what you need to know. All of their resurrections were temporary. That guy that escaped the lion's den and those three young men that got out of the fiery furnace, they don't, they're not still alive. Eventually, their bodies broke down by years and by disease, and eventually their families and friends had to say goodbye to them for the last time, too. It's only temporary. Now, you might be asking a very good question right now. So what difference does faith make? And I think that question reveals something very deep in our heart, and it should cause us concern. Let me explain that. Is faith only a way to make my life easier and better for me? Uh, any infomercial will promise that. In research for this message, I actually Googled the 10 worst infomercials of all time. I thought maybe I could show them to you. I didn't want to after I saw them. <laughs> They're terrible. Some of them are borderline obscene. If you don't believe me, Google 10 worst infomercials of all time. And some of you are doing it right now on your smart devices. And that is not cool. So, so if you're going through a painful season, does it mean that you are believing the wrong things or doing the wrong things? And here's what I want you to see. Faith in yourself is not enough. That's the problem, is that even when we think we're trusting and believing in God, what we're really doing is we're saying, this is how my life will work best. This is how much money I need to make. This is where I need to work. This is who I need to marry. This is how I need to live. And then I know my life will be good because you know what makes your life good, right? Except I know lots of people who got exactly what they wanted and it didn't work. When we treat faith as a way to make our life easier and get what we want, our faith really isn't in God. Our faith is in us. I know what's best, and I just need God to help me get it. And Scripture indicates that's a problem. Scripture calls us to do something else. It calls us to put our faith in Christ. Faith in Christ is enough. Now, that's challenging for lots of people in this room, and I get it. Um, you're not sure you can believe every story or miracle that's recorded in Scripture, and you're not convinced that all the wisdom of Scripture is something that you can build a life on. In fact, you probably already know some things in Scripture you disagree with. That's why the resurrection is such a critically important thing for every one of us. The resurrection helps us begin our journey. And if you don't believe in the resurrection, there's some questions I would have for you. So how do you explain all the eyewitness accounts? Because there were people who saw Jesus. You know, courts take eyewitness account every day, and that's considered legitimate and valid testimony. And by the way, you could say, well, someone was just hallucinating. That, that can happen. Um, but groups of people don't have the same hallucination. And there was a group of people that was larger than all the people in this room right now, and they saw the resurrected Christ, and many of them were alive at the time of, of the writing of Paul's letters, and he actually indicated that you could go ask them for, the, for yourself, that they could bear witness. Not only is there eyewitness accounts, but there's this transformation that occurs. If you look at Peter before the resurrection, he's not anybody we would aspire to be, right? Peter had... Well, Peter's, one of his problems is he had a little bit of a foul mouth. Peter could, could well, he was a fisherman, right? He could let it go. And uh, how many are glad that so far I haven't dropped any bombs? And <laughs> so we're not aspiring to be like Peter before the resurrection. The other thing is, is, as loud as he was, he really wasn't all that brave. The night that Jesus was arrested, when he was asked by a servant girl, this isn't a military commando, a servant girl if, she knew, if he knew Jesus, three times he denied that he ever knew him at all, within minutes. This is not the bravest person. And yet, after the resurrection, he becomes one of the bravest, most courageous individuals that will stare death in the face and be imprisoned, and he won't back up. What happened? How does a person change like that? 
Look at, at the Apostle Paul. His original name was Saul. He was a persecutor of the church and one of the most brilliant intellects of his time. We know he spoke at least five languages fluently. He was a student of history. He was a student of archaeology. He was a student of literature, and he persecuted the church. He wanted people who followed Jesus to be put to death, and he was willing to participate in that. And yet after he met the resurrected Christ for himself, he winds up leading a group of believers, to help plant churches all over the world. How do you explain that transformation? 2,000 years that transformation has been going on. You would think that the influence of this man would wane over time. It doesn't wane. It gets even greater. Today on this planet, there are 2.3 billion people who consider themselves followers of Jesus Christ. That's more than in the history of any time on this planet. And his influence is not decreasing, it's increasing. So how do you explain that? So, well, I just don't believe it. Okay. But now you have to know you've left evidence, and now you're taking your own step of faith. You're deciding not to believe it, not based on what you've seen, but what you like or what you prefer. That's a challenging position to be in. So the first thing I, or next thing I want you to see here is faith in Christ does not exempt us from real life. If you put your faith in Christ, I wish you would always be thin. I wish your hair would never turn gray or fall out. I wish your children would always get great grades in school and be stunning athletes. And if you put your faith in Christ, uh, all of those things that I just said you wish wouldn't happen can happen. Coming into this room does not exempt you from real life. But here's the point. Faith in Christ can redeem all of life. And this is stunning. Uh, let me give you an example. When Jesus appeared to his followers after his resurrection, one of the things he does is he actually shows them his wounds. Here's where the nails were driven into my hand and into my feet. Here's where the spear was thrust into my side. I've had a few wounds. I try to hide them. By the way, not just the physical ones, the emotional ones too. On a Father's Day one time, I was out playing baseball, took a shot right to my nose, dropped me on the ground, broke my nose. Spent the Father's Day, I spent two Father's Days in a row in an emergency room. <laughs> That's another story. It's just stories are reeling off in my head right now. I had to do a wedding the next week after my nose was broken. I looked like a raccoon. Both my eyes were black. My nose was, was swollen. And, and so I went to my wife and I said, can you do anything to help? And she had, she had makeup. Now, usually I'm not a fan of that. But on that day, she put it on. And what I can tell you is, it didn't really help. <laughs> I, I'm so grateful that they didn't take any pictures of me that day. They just, Pastor, you go stand over there and we'll... Oh, my goodness. We hide our wounds and our bruises, but Jesus doesn't hide them. He calls attention to them because he believes that God was doing something through them. See, In the ancient world, we think people are just superstitious and very susceptible, and they just believe anything. In the ancient world, the worldviews wouldn't accept resurrection. In Jewish worldview, the only time resurrection would occur was at the end of all things when everyone would be resurrected. This, this, these one-off resurrections, not in their worldview. And Greeks, they didn't believe in resurrection at all. How did people who didn't have a worldview that accepted that, they even had a worldview that opposed it, change their mind? And the answer was... They met a resurrected person. They saw Jesus. And what they saw astonished them. Not just that he was alive, but God could actually redeem to bring something good out of what had been painful and destructive to him. It's so easy to make assumptions about the goodness of God based on the circumstances of our life. 
When life is good for me, then God is good. And then when life is not good for me, where is God? And here's what I want you to know this morning, is that when you want to assess the goodness and the greatness of God, don't look at your circumstances. Look at the cross. You want to see how, God, how good God is? He absorbed all of our suffering, not because he deserved it, but because he thought you were worth it. As he's taking on all this punishment and pain, he doesn't strike back, he doesn't blame. The heart of God will not change no matter what you use against him. It can be spears and nails and thorns, and his dying breaths are, forgive them. Just think about that. If God can take the torture of Christ on the cross and redeem it, imagine what he can do with the things that you are going through right now. He can take your failure, your loss, your sorrow, and he can work something redemptive through it. What if God could work through the very thing that you thought was the worst thing to make your character stronger and to help others and to build your faith and to reveal even deeper and greater things about God himself? That's what God accomplishes in the cross and the resurrection. Now, there are people here uh, who do not believe that you need any help. And this, this is, there's lots of people in our world like this. I don't need any help. I'll figure it out. I'll, I'll look at myself. I'll find what I need. And here's the thing. Every single one of us can improve, but none of us can achieve perfection. Every single one of us can apologize, but none of us can go back and undo what we did or the pain that we've caused. That's just part of human existence. We can't do it. So we have to start with humility. I can't do this on my own. Some people think that Christianity is a proud religion, that we look down our noses at other people thinking we're better. Exact opposite of true. We know we could never be good enough on our own. So we just admit it. And we burn grace when we start this journey, and we burn grace every day thereafter because we need the grace of God in our lives. Now, I know this single talk isn't going to answer all your questions or conquer all your doubts. Um, I want you to know two things. You don't have to be a perfect person to start your spiritual journey, and your faith doesn't have to be perfect either. You don't have to get to the place where you have no doubts to start. Jesus said, even the smallest amount of faith can make the biggest difference. So what makes heaven so wonderful, and most people, if given the option, would say they prefer that to alternatives. What makes heaven so wonderful is it's the place where God's will is always done. That's what Jesus said. God's will is always done. That's what makes it great. There's joy, there's peace, there's justice, there's love, and a lot more. Because God's will is always done. But Jesus doesn't just ask us. He teaches us to pray like this, right? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He's, it's not a prayer just to get us out of here. It's a prayer that gets there in us. And this is a game changer. Maybe you thought you came in today and what you're hoping is is that you'll hear a talk and be able to say some words that guarantee that if something should happen to you, you get to go to heaven. I believe that can happen, but I, that's not my full agenda today. Just so you know, my agenda is not just to get you to heaven. My agenda is to get heaven into you. And the way that happens is the same way it happens in heaven where we just, we just accept God's will. In fact, just try this right now. Just, just put a hand out in front of you like this and just say these words. Your will be done. It's astonishing how God can use that to begin to bring transformation into our hearts and change our lives. You don't have to have it all figured out, but if you can start there, everything begins to change. So that's how you actually begin your spiritual journey. I'm going to ask us to bow our heads. The reason I'm asking you to bow your heads and just close your eyes is because I want this to be a relatively private moment for you. 
once again, I'm not asking, are you convinced that everything in Scripture is 100% true and accurate? I'm not asking you to sign off on every doctrinal statement you've heard or the ones you haven't heard. I'm asking if you're willing to trust. Maybe God is whispering to your heart and he's giving you GPS directions. Start here. Take this turn. So maybe the turn is just a willingness to acknowledge. I'm not going to depend on myself. I'm going to depend on what God has done instead. I'm going to start there. So if you'd like to start that journey today, I'm, I'm going to start in the section that's over by the lobby wall. And all I'm going to ask you to do is look at me. I'm, I'm not going to do anything that will embarrass you, but I would like to acknowledge, don't just think a thought in your heart. Let's do something to mark the moment. And so I'm going to start in that section. I'm going to work through every section all the way over to the windows. And today, if you'd like to start that journey, all you have to do is look at me. Just wait until I acknowledge you. Okay? We'll start over in this section by the, by the lobby doors. And just if you're starting that journey today, just look right at me. Just look right at me. Thank you. I see that person. Next section over. Just look right at me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just keep looking right at me until I acknowledge you. Thank you. Thank you. Just keep looking. Just keep looking right at me. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm in the section that's right in front of me. Just keep looking right at me until I acknowledge you. Okay, just thank you. Just keep looking. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just keep looking until I, until I acknowledge you. Thank you. Next section over. Just look until I acknowledge you. Okay, last section over. Thank you. I see that person. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just keep looking. I'm going to ask that we all say a prayer out loud together, not because most of us haven't done this already, but because we want to be encouraging to those who maybe are doing this for the first time. So would you pray this with me? Heavenly Father, today I decide to trust you. I'm tired of depending on myself. I don't just want what I want. I want to find out what you want for my life. I trust what Jesus did for me, and I trust him to lead me. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we just welcome those into the family of faith this morning? Amen. Let's all stand together.